Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm coming at you from a very slightly different angle. I thought I'd do that thing that some people do as well, where you can see the audio being recorded in the background. Also, I've got my curtains open, so there should be some more natural light. Uh, so, fingers crossed this works for you guys. I don't know, you get to see a new part of the room. This is my computer here. This is a dog. Uh, a guide dog, because my mum sponsors a guide dog in my name. Today, I would like to talk to you about A Skin Full of Shadows by Francis Hardinge. So, uh, this is my second Francis Hardinge book that I've read, and I actually read this one as a buddy read with Anthony Andrews, who has a booktube channel. He hasn't been around for a while, but I think he's planning on coming back, so that's pretty cool. And yeah, he emailed me asking me if I'd be interested in doing a buddy read with him, and funnily enough, he gave me like two or three books to choose from, and one of them was this one. And uh, I read The Lie Tree not far, not that long ago, and I'll link to the review of that down below. And I enjoyed it so much that I wanted to read some more Frances Hardinge. She does this kind of weird, it's like magical realism, historical fiction, I guess I would call it. And it's also kind of YA, but also not necessarily as well, you know? I think that that's one of the interesting things about her work so far, is that Anthony, who's, I think he's 13 or 14, um, I don't know, because I can't... It's been a while, so I don't know when his, I might have missed a birthday, you know, but um, you know, he can read it and he'll get the, the same level of enjoyment out of it as I will as an adult and the same as, you know, probably, I don't know, my friend Dave who's like 65 or whatever. It's kind of timeless and ageless in that respect. I'm going to read you the blurb and then I'm going to go through and pick up some of my tabs and share with you some of the bits that I enjoyed. There are quite a lot in this because I really like the way that Francis Hardinge writes. So, oh, is it Hardinge or Harding? I think it might be Harding. I've heard somebody else say Harding, but it's got an E on the end. So I'm like, that's, that's inge, but we'll just, I don't know, we'll pretend it's French and that, you know, there's an invisible letter. Anyway, I'll try, I'll just try not to say her surname again. Is it a she? I hope it's a she. I'm really underprepared for this video, apparently. I don't know. Okay, the blurb. We see ghosts and they are drawn to us. Sometimes when a person dies, their spirit goes looking for somewhere to hide. Some people have space within them, perfect for hiding. Makepeace has learned to defend herself from the ghosts that try to possess her in the night, desperate for refuge. But one day a dreadful event causes her to drop her guard. Now she has a spirit inside her. The spirit is wild, angry and strong, and it may be her only defence when she is sent to live with her father's cruel and powerful ancestors. But as she plans her escape to a country torn apart by civil war, make peace must decide which is worse, possession or death. And so yeah, I think the time setting, there is a direct quote that, uh, that I'll share in a bit that gives us an exact uh, like time marker reference, but it's during like, when the the king and the parliament were at war basically england was at civil war so i want to i want to um start by just reading this is the start of chapter one and i think this is a really powerful opening the third time make peace woke screaming from the nightmare her mother was angry i told you not to dream that way again she hissed keeping her voice low to avoid waking the rest of the house or if you do you must not cry out i could not help it whispered make peace frightened by her mother's fierce tone Mother took Makepeace's hands, her face tense and unsmiling in the early morning light. You do not like your home. You do not want to live with your mother. I do, I do, Makepeace exclaimed, feeling her world lurch under her feet. Then you must learn to help it. If you scream every night, terrible things will happen. We may be thrown out of this house. A lot of pressure to put a little kid under, you know? So this next bit here, this happens quite early on and it actually needs to happen to move the story on. But it's also very sad and the way she blames herself, so... Mother's body was found after the bloodshed and the arrests, after the rioters were thrown into retreat. Nobody was ever quite sure what it was that had struck her in the head and caused her death. Perhaps a wildly swung poker, perhaps an accidental kick to the head with a hobnailed boot, perhaps a stray bullet that struck her and moved on. Makepeace did not know and did not care. The riot had killed Mother and Makepeace had led her there. It was all Makepeace's fault. And so from here she gets sent off to live with like her father's family, I guess, uh, and her grandfather. But the thing here, this is, this is where the magical realism comes in. They have the ability to like harbor ghosts within them. I thought this was interesting here because this talks about puritanism. So, um, you don't look mad to me, James said with annoying confidence. And I don't think you've got the strength. What's your name? Make peace. Make peace? Oh, I forgot you were a puritan. I'm not, retorted make peace, turning red. The godly and poplar had never called themselves Puritans, and when Obadiah had described them that way, she had sensed that the word was not a compliment. Does everyone have a name like that where you come from? asked James. I hear they're all called Fight the Good Fight, Spit in the Eye of the Devil, Sorry for Sin, Miserable Sinners Are We All, and things like that. Makepeace did not answer. She wasn't sure whether she was being mocked, and the congregation in Poplar had included one Sorry for Sin, usually shortened to Sorry. Yeah, we have this little conversation here with Sir Thomas. He says, I often thought about your mother after she ran away from Grace Hayes. 
She was so young to be alone in the world, barely 15, and expecting a child, of course. He frowned and twisted one of his buttons. Was she happy with the life she found? Makepeace did not know how to answer. Right now, her memories of mother were too painful to handle, like shards of glass. Sometimes, she said at last. I suppose, said Sir Thomas softly, that is all any of us can ask. I think this little chapter is interesting as well, just with the casual way that it's said, I think it makes it quite powerful. Simon's late mother had done her duty and obligingly turned out eight children before dying of a fever. Four of them were still breathing. The two adult daughters had been advantageously married off. Their nine-year-old sister was in the care of a cousin and had been quietly promised in marriage to a baronet's son. Simon was the only surviving son. So there's a point at which um, Makepeace tries to run away with James and I thought this was interesting and I wondered if it would actually work. Once the fields yielded to more, they abandoned the lane and cut across country. Makepeace took out a tiny pinch of pepper she had stolen from Mistress Goatley's treasure chest of spices and scattered it across the path to discourage any dog from following their trail. Unfortunately, they were unsuccessful. And then we have uh, here, which, which section is this? Because it's sit, sp split into several different sections. So this is part two, Goatley's Cat. And I just think this is uh, really, again, really poetically, beautifully written introduction to this new, new section. So chapter 10. A lot can change in two years and a season. 27 months is long enough for a place to seep into your bones. Its colours become the palette of your mind. Its sounds your private music. Its cliffs or spires overshadow your dreams. Its walls funnel your thoughts. That's kind of a recurring motif throughout as well. So then we have, uh, in, later on, there's a new section. In two years and a season, you can learn from your failures. You can discover patience and cunning. You can teach everybody to overlook you. Then we have another one. In two years and a season, a country can fall apart. Cracks prove deeper than anybody expected. They can become crevasses and then chasms. And this is where we get uh, an idea of where we are in time. As the year of our Lord 1641 wore itself out and yielded to 1642, the tensions between the King and Parliament became ever more dangerous. I thought this was really, and uh, this again is very insightful. And this is something that we forget now in the age of like fast consumerism and whatnot. Um, so I'm just going to read this out. Amid the laughter and uproar, Makepeace saw one of Simon's friends slap the lace handkerchief into his cup of ale and crumple it into a sodden ball to throw at his friend's face. She felt an unexpected sting of anger. Stop being a Puritan, she told herself. It's his handkerchief and his ale. He can spoil them if he wants. And yet the waste enraged her. Somebody had worked for weeks to make that lace, stitch by careful stitch. Unknown sailors had braved terrible dangers to carry the soup spices from other lands. She herself had spent some time preparing the lamb's wool ale. The young blade's little show of lordly high spirits had wasted more than money or fine goods. It had wasted other people's time, sweat and effort without a thought. And so again, make pieces planning to run away and... I think this is a good insight into the way that you think and you kind of almost get Stockholm Syndrome, you know? The next day, the house felt bereft, uncertain. As the other servants gossiped, wondered and worried, Makepeace cupped herself busy and her face placid. All the while she was thinking to herself, this may be the last time I clean this tankard. Perhaps this is the last time I bring Mistress Goatley her tea. She had not expected these thoughts to give her such a pang. Habits, places and faces grew into you over time, like tree roots burrowing into stonework. And so we have Lord Felmot here and he's Basically, his head is filled to the brim with ghosts. So I'm going to read this out. Um, Lord Felmot sat waiting for her, and never had his stillness look less serene. As he walked in, he turned his head to watch her approach. Not for the first time, Makepeace wondered which of the ghosts within him had moved his head, and how they decided such things. Did they vote? Had they all taken on different tasks? Or had they worked together for so many lifetimes that they were used to acting as one? Lord Felmot was not a man. He was an ancient committee. A parliament of deathly rooks in a dying tree. So there's a family called Crow in this, and as we all know, uh, the group noun or whatever, collective noun for a group of crows is a murder of crows. And here we have it at the start of chapter 16. And again, this is right at the start of the chapter and right at the start of part three, Maud. Ten minutes later, a small murder of crows were gathered around Lord Felmer. White crow, young crow, and old crow the steward all stared at the lolling form of their master, as if the, as if the moon had fallen and broken at their feet. A goblet of brandy had been brought from the kitchen, and Makepeace held it to the invalid's lips. And then they tell uh, they tell Makepeace that she's going to take on the name of Maud, which was a real girl who died, and uh, she says, like, Maud is a little dead girl in the ground. Makepeace knew she had to hide her feelings, but this was a step too far. I cannot steal her name. It is not stolen, but given. Young Crow gave her a rictus smile of annoyance. Think of it as a hand-me-down. But if I take on a new name, everyone will wonder at it, exclaimed Makepeace in desperation. I am known here, in the house, on the estate, in the villages. If you dress me as a lady and call me Maud, nobody will be fooled. They all know who I am. Nobody cares, 
Elder James interrupted coldly. You are of no consequence. You have nothing that we have not given you, and nobody in this whole country will raise their voice against us. If our dogs chased you across the moors until you dropped, nobody would help you, and nobody would breathe a word about it afterwards. You are who we say you are, and if we say you are heir to a destiny greater than you ever deserved, and wealth beyond your merits, then that is what you will be. This was interesting too. Uh, after this, Makepeace was told that she was to have a bath. Makepeace received the news with trepidation. She had never had a real bath before, and she had heard people say that they were dangerous. The water could seep in through the holes in your skin, bringing all manner of sickness with it. Like most people, she usually just rubbed herself clean with a rag, and even then didn't strip herself bare, but took off a few garments at a time so that she would not get cold. Nakedness would be a fine way to catch a trill. And the thing with that is, the reason why they're giving her a bath and they're checking her for lice and all this stuff is because she's a vessel. They're going to put a ghost inside her head and basically possess her body. So they want to make sure her body is ready for them to take over, which is chilling, you know? We have this moment where Makepeace almost kills someone. And I think this is a really interesting thought that she has. Makepeace thought of the smoke snake forcing its way into her mind and for a moment felt a terrible temptation to stamp on Lady April's skull and crush it like an egg. But she did not. They deserve to die, she thought groggily. But I do not deserve to be a murderer. She didn't want to lower herself to their level. I thought this bit was interesting. So she tracks, or she's trying to track down uh, Dr. Benjamin Quick. So she says, did you ever hear of a doctor called Benjamin Quick? No, I do not recall the name. The baker's brow furrowed. But if he knows his physic, he will be busy and much in demand. Did you know that we have the camp fever here now? Camp fever? Make peace's companions exchange glances, looking surprised and alarmed. The soldiers brought it back with them from the camps outside Reading, explained the baker, failing to keep the bitterness from his voice. My wife has been brewing cures, but I fear that making it costs us dear because of the nutmeg, so we must ask coin for it. Nutmeg was a rare spice known for its healing virtues, and its nigh magical ability to protect against plagues and other ills. So we have some interesting lines of dialogue here, I'm just going to read two of them out. Um, this is a hungry city, she said. Even honest folk forget themselves sometimes. The devil has no better friend than an empty belly. Uh, and then we also have... Uh, b -b -b Give a man a sword and pistol, said Helen, and leave him hungry for a few weeks, and everybody will start to look like the enemy. And then we have another call back to that bath that she had, so it says here. Makepeace was still lurking near the hatchway. Her little bag of dried flowers suddenly seemed a pitiful defence against the foul airs of the attic. She did not know how easily the fever might jump from one person to another. Furthermore, she had been given a bath barely two nights before, so her pores might still be open to every disease. Dun dun dun. So uh, we get to a bit where Makepeace starts taking on additional ghosts in her head. So here at the start of chapter 23 we have this scene when um, the, the ghost, she first has more than one ghost basically. There was a terrible rushing cacophony inside Makepeace's head like clouds at war. Something banged sharply against the back of her head. Makepeace was staring up at the rafters where spiderwebs hung thick with dust. She had fallen backwards she realised. There was a tightness across her chest that left her gasping for air. God, she could hear the doctor yelling, his voice impossibly distant and yet tingling with closeness. God in heaven, what hell is this? At the same time, there came the bass rumble of Bear's growl, confused and menacing. And then the doctor tries to get her to take some stuff. Because uh, the doctor, like, he dies and she absorbs his ghost, basically. And he says, he asks her to take some stuff and she says, I'll take the tools, your purse and a few of the books, Makepeace said quickly, but none of your clothes. If I die of your sickness, then both of our ghosts will be left without a house. And forgive me, but I don't smoke a pipe. And then the doctor starts giving her vi advice from inside her head, and she's trying to t treat this guy who's been injured by a sword. And he says, uh, he may well die despite our efforts. I think I should warn you of this now. I'm very good at what I do, but my job is hard and a sword's task is easy. Humans are fragile things, and breaking us is far easier than fixing us. Since the start of this war, most of my patients have died. And then Makepeace is found and asks where she's from, and it says here, uh, Staffordshire, said Makepeace promptly. She hoped that the county was far enough away to explain her accent, but close enough that, might, that she might have walked the distance. You're a long way from that county, said the other soldier, his face darkening with suspicion. I'm from Staffordshire. And I thought this was a really nice bit of uh, an explanation here as well, which does then feed into the resolution of the story. Uh... Oh, come now, snapped the doctor. Our existence may be the stuff of waking nightmares, but there will be, there will be rules to it. I believe Simon Felmont has unraveled the truth. The key is expectation, belief. I think ghosts can see without using their living host's eyes. However, we are used to the bodies we once had. Your bear believes that he can only see through eyes that are open. However, he also expects to be able to see in the dark. If I am right, then that explains why there are so few ghosts. Dead souls only become ghosts if they expect to do so. Bear never expected it. Makepeace frowned in thought, but he was very angry when he died. In fact, I'm not sure he noticed he had died. 
So his spirit lingered, said the doctor, sounding pleased. Then there are those who die in desperation and doubt, thinking their souls lost, like your Puritan friend and the favoured Felmots, who die knowing that their ghosts will have a new home. And you, said Makepeace, feeling her spirit sink guiltily. You expected to become a ghost because I told you that you could. And then Makepeace gets accused of being a witch because she's close friends with this cat and she says here, I dropped a scrap for it. It's a cat. You can buy any cat's love for an inch of bacon rind. And she's saying she can't believe that her joy, her, you know, talking to animals is being used against her in this way. So overall, I did really enjoy this book. I thought it started to slow a little bit near the end, but overall I still gave it a pretty solid 4 out of 5. I just like what the author does with the worlds that she creates, and I definitely want to read more of her books. I also looked her up, and she's not that old. She's like mid-40s maybe, so she's still got a good, you know, 20, 30 years of writing ahead of her too, so I'm just excited to see what she comes up with, and I will be definitely be reading more. So there we have it. That's what I thought of A Skin Full of Shadows by Francis Harden. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.